Well, good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, Lewis Medcalf speaking to you from Nashville, Tennessee, where it's uh, rather hot. And uh, we're going to be talking about editing specification masters. And uh, David Stutzman is with us from New Jersey, and he uh, has actually written uh, spec text for several years. And uh, so we're going to try to look at what are some of the issues with using published master specification systems. They're, these things are a great resource and enable us to do things that we could not otherwise do. Uh, the amount of time that it would take for an individual practitioner to research all of the reference standards and keep abreast of all the products is, would be just overwhelming. Uh, especially these days when new products are being coming up with uh, the manufacturers are coming up with new products almost every month, and it would be uh, it would be extremely time consuming. You would it's probably spend more time updating the master than you did writing actual project specs using your masters, and so using a um, published master system uh, can be a great savings. You know, for time, and it's a great resource. And um, I've been using uh, at three different firms master specs since 1982, and uh, so we uh, have extensive experience in, with that, and it's been a, uh, a great boon. And I've learned a lot myself from it. Um, before we go on, uh, Rob, I'm having a little problem. My the display has disappeared on me. Yes, I was going to mention too. I, Rob, I never got the screen to share my monitor, so I'm looking oh, here. at your screen at the moment. I mine just mine just says download complete. Exactly. Um, here, let me make you the presenter here, Dave. Sorry about that. All right. Ah, there we go. Okay, so, but anyway, we are thrilled that uh, to have as many folks on hand uh, as have uh, shown up so far, and we want to encourage you to view this as an interactive discussion rather than just a, a lecture by David and myself, primarily David, since he's the brains of the outfit. That <laughs> that uh, uh, last month we had a really good discussion on. Uh, substitutions both before and after a contract is signed and we want to hear from you we want to hear your ideas your, uh, and you, you have a lot to uh, contribute to this and if you have some questions to try to stump us why I'm sure David will be happy to uh, give you his best so we're going to go over to David and he's going to talk begin with why are spec masters the way they are well, we'll try and let me back up and see if I can get things back to where they're supposed to be. All right, spec masters. One of the things uh, specification masters are trying to do is really to be that 80% uh, of what you're going to need on a particular project. And you know, the people writing the master specification systems, whomever they are, can't possibly imagine everything that you're going to have on your project. So there's always going to be that last 20% uh, or thereabouts that you're going to have some really good fun uh, trying to finish up the project. Uh, where the specifications are, for the most part, take two different tacks if you look at the systems that are out there. Master spec is one that is you're creating projects by deletion uh, from the master system. Spec text, on the other hand, is one where you you start with a a good solid outline and you build the specification to match your own practice by adding additional information uh, to to reflect what your own practice is. So there, there are two different approaches, and I think because master spec is by far and away the uh, dominant force in the industry, 
probably most everyone is better familiar with the edit by deletion to get down to a project spec from uh, starting with a master system. David, why don't we stop now and do poll questions? Okay. Go ahead. You got that one, Rob? Sure do. Okay. Yeah, so let's find out of everyone out there which systems are you using. Uh, we've got the three main uh, spec systems listed as answers to the the poll question here, and I'm sure there are some others. And if you're using eSpec, that is a uh, a special link to master spec. So go. So if you're using a, an eSpec user, go ahead and just uh, choose the master spec answer. Okay, and it looks like. Uh, pretty much where we thought it might be. We had a good majority uh, using master spec with 65%, followed by uh, spec link uh, with 20%. Uh, we had a good, good number of other, and I suspect maybe those would be office masters uh, that might very well be based on uh, master spec or even spec link or some other system. And we have uh, a, a little bit of a surprise, I guess, 13% they're not using any. Uh, maybe these are folks that are on the line that are not generally writing specifications. So, uh, but the majority still with master spec. Let's go ahead and do the second question, Rob, if you would, please. Certainly. And here we're just trying to figure out get a, a little feel for uh, how folks are using it. Do you use the uh, the system pretty much straight as it is, as it comes, maybe just uh, tweaking the, the font size and what information you put in the headers and footers, or do you use it as a basis for writing your own spec masters, uh, or do you only consult it as a reference document? And, and of course, there are those that don't use it at all. Okay, and we're doing pretty well there. Uh, Seventy percent as a starting point for creating a set of mass office masters, and that's not a surprise. Uh, I think most everybody that's using uh, some of these commercial masters is probably approaching it the same way. But the the masters, I think, part of the thing that you need to understand is that they are trying to be all things to all projects so that they're trying to encompass uh, virtually everything, the, the full gamut of what you might run into. And <clears throat> to a large degree, that makes a lot of them uh, seem excessive compared to what you may need for a particular project. And that, that can create some of the difficulty in using some of these masters. So seeing folks using them as a starting point, I think, is an excellent way to go because hopefully you're tailoring them <coughs> to suit your practice uh, before you even start editing them for a project. OK, Rob, are we back to uh, screen view, or is it we still have a poll? Did we lose Rob? There we go. There okay. we go. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, that's all right. <laughs> We're just trying to keep tabs on you here. Okay, so the the types of projects that these masters are written for, uh, again, they can't encompass absolutely everything, but they're trying to deal with uh, as many as they can. They want to be able to deal with publicly bid projects and privately bid projects. They want to be able to deal with whether or not it's a, a negotiated contract and potentially a CM contract. And probably the biggest uh, changes in for accommodating those uh, types of projects is really going to be in the Division I sections where you're trying to set up uh, the different roles of each of the players and how you're actually delivering the project. And I'm not sure uh, Lewis had down on one of our notes uh, to discuss 
integrated project delivery. And I'm not aware that any of the masters are really dealing with that just yet. If uh, anybody out there senses that that's not correct, please chime in and let me know. But uh, my experience with master spec and spec text would say no, they haven't. Uh, they didn't dive into that project delivery method just yet. Another factor is the project complexity. Is that there? Uh, you know, we all know about complex projects, large hospitals, high-rise buildings, airports, performing arts centers, where you might need some special requirements that you would not use for simple projects such as branch banks or shell and core office building, tenant improvements or uh, neighborhood library uh, building. So that that's a, can be a major factor and again looking through the, the um, available paragraphs that are in the spec masters we need to be thinking about how do I make this project specific? What do I need at this time for this project in this place? Okay. And <clears throat> the other thing that we see masters doing is they're trying to accommodate the, the varying ways that you can actually specify for a particular project. So they're giving you enough information to use the four primary methods, whether it's descriptive, reference, somewhat for performance, and certainly proprietary methods. So that you, with using the masters, you can dive in and say, OK, I'm going to specify model XYZ from manufacturer A and be done uh, using solely a proprietary method. But then if you make an, that choice, you have probably a lot of deletion to do in the, in the specification to take it down to a true proprietary method of specifying. If you're trying to use it for performance, you may find yourself in a position of needing to add a good deal of information because the masters will only have a limited amount of performance information, usually the structural requirements, some uh, thermal type performance for building envelope systems, but if you're uh, if you're doing this because the the design team is allowing the contractor to actually do the final design, showing essentially an image of what's required, you may end up with a needing quite a bit more. Uh, in the way of performance to ensure that you get what you need. How are we doing with our audience here, Rob? Anybody want to chime in just yet? Well, I see that Catherine has uh, made a comment that uh, one of our poll questions uh, pointed out that many government uh, projects require the use of specs intact, which is a, uh, a government system that is not only uh, content driven but it has a special software that has to be learned and used. Um, uh, I did several projects for one of the divisions of the Navy <coughs> at my previous firm and actually had to go to uh, Norfolk, Virginia and spend two days in a seminar trying to figure out how to use that software which I would describe as expert tolerant rather than user friendly. <laughs> expert tolerant, I love that. <laughs> yeah, specs intact is a whole other challenge uh, only because you're having to specify without naming manufacturers, without naming products, and relying very heavily on performance to be able to get what you want. We had another comment. Uh, I don't have the name here, but it says, in response to the second poll question, we've used master spec out of the box for years and have just begun trying to create office masters from them. My biggest challenge is keeping up with the quarterly updates and trying to figure out if I should add those changes to the masters or restart with the update and add our modifications to it. That is the perennial challenge. And I, I can tell you that from having 
dealt with uh, spec text and having maintained that product, that's probably one of the biggest questions that we had coming back from subscribers uh, is to how you deal with those updates because if we're in the case of master spec or, or spec text, the quarterly updates, you're likely to get 70 sections that might have been modified during the last quarter and trying to go back and through all of those and decipher what it is that was changed, a daunting task. Uh, if you're using Microsoft Word as your word processor, even doing document compare can be really frustrating because I have had Microsoft Word in essence just give up and say that the entire section, the original entire section was deleted and the entire section is new. So That's especially true, David, right now because uh, Master Spec is in the throes of converting to the more recent uh, section format. Uh, and so there are, so even when there's not all that much change in the actual text, <clears throat> there are <clears throat> massive format changes. Uh, my advice on this, and like I say, I've been doing it for many years, uh, what I found most useful is to uh, start over with the new one <clears throat> and then transfer all of my uh, office uh, special stuff to the new version. Uh, just That's what works for me. And um, the uh, frustration is that uh, because I also do a certain amount of reformatting. Um, that's not too difficult if you can learn to write some uh, macros that will change the styles to uh, give it the appearance that you want. Um, and actually, uh, David and I have talked about uh, doing a follow-up session on this program uh, on talking about some of the practical things that we can do with word processing. Uh, to speed up uh, editing and reformatting specs. So we might be actually discuss that at a future date. Right. Good question, good question. Right. One other thing, though, Louis, just to point out that with uh, BSD SpecLink, they do have an advantage over word processing-based systems because they're able to essentially, with the flick of a switch, display where the changes were made in the master and then allow you to either select or to include those changes or ignore them. So that is one big advantage uh, that BSD SpecLink does bring to updating. That's true, that's true. All right. I think we had some other uh, comments and questions, Rob? Yes, yes, yes we do. Um, Kevin O'Byrne also wrote in, He's, he was saying that uh, his biggest question uh, which, or I guess what, however you want to interpret that, uh, standard division zero docs, a commercial master guide spec system is written to coordinate? Well, of course, until just recently, uh, master spec has not published series zero documents. Uh, that's a fairly new uh, development. And in many respects, uh, the series zero documents uh, function almost like the uh, the booster stages of a rocket to get it into orbit because they fall away and there's really not a huge amount of coordination that is necessary between them and the actual uh, product specifications because they're not contract documents and they only deal with uh, primarily with issues up front. And I would agree with you, Lewis, that yeah, the uh, it was interesting. I thought when Master Spec actually did introduce the Division Zero because that was a huge leap for them. Uh, they had ignored it essentially for years, and that was relatively recent development. And I see that Cynthia also pointed out that a database such as SpecLink E will update your base and keep all your edits and added material that, to simplify the updating process. We appreciate that. Okay, and yes, only because that's, again, it's not a word processing per se, and eSpecs is uh, working in HTML uh, or XML. Uh, and so I believe that, do that. 
And uh, Master Spec has got a new product called Alterix uh, that uh, will, I think, do the same thing. I frankly haven't looked into it as much as I should have yet. Um, but uh, so there is help on the way is the, the answer to that question. And I, somebody else mentioned that. And I believe um, our old Tommy Smith down in Memphis wants us to talk about mixing sessions, sections from different master systems. Um, I think we'll put that one off for a little while. We'll, maybe we'll get back to that later. Okay. All right. So what are some of the pitfalls? Well, some of them I think are explained just in, in what you're seeing on the screen here. But um, let me just get everything working here. What what I get concerned about in the masters, because if we're looking at these things as being something that's including virtually everything that you need for every project imaginable, if in doubt, and the word is take it out. Uh, we have, I've been in a position of reviewing other architects uh, specifications that they've written where they're looking for some cer certain technical help. And what I've discovered in going through, especially if somebody's using master spec, is that there's so much text in master spec that if it can be really confusing as to why the text is even there, what I find them doing is apparently they don't know why it's there because they don't know why it's there, they believe that it should remain in the specification. And at that point, they're creating more confusion than anything else. So this is my advice to anyone in editing master specs. If you don't know what it is, and if you can't research it to find out what it is, get rid of it. The last thing in the world you want to do is uh, be sitting in a meeting with the contractor or the owner or worse yet a lawyer and they ask, ask you well what does this paragraph mean and you have to say I don't know <laughs> you don't want to be in that position absolutely there are enough things that we don't know we don't need to put the <laughs> world in on all those secrets <laughs> And one of the uh, places where that happens is excessive testing. Um, uh, I have a horror story. One, um, one of the first assignments that I got when I started at my new <coughs> uh, job a couple or three years ago is that we had published, had done a uh, suburban office building, kind of typical uh, speculative office building. And uh, the developer, uh, when he got the price tag on the field testing, it was found that it was about twice what he was used to paying for those kinds of buildings. And uh, so my, the task that I was assigned was to look at the specs and go through and see if we couldn't live without some of the testing. And, and sure enough, that was the case, is that uh, our firm uses master spec as the basis for spec masters. And the young fellow who had edited the project spec, when he was in doubt, he left it in, thinking, you know, of course, hey, this has been fully researched. It's authoritative. And so we had really an excessive amount of testing. Um, again, you have to adjust that to the level of complexity, the, the type of project. Uh, you know, there are a number of factors to make a project specific. There are tests that you might want to have if you're doing a high-rise building, but if you're doing a two-story office building out in the suburbs, it's just it's no big deal. Um, one in particular that I've seen all, over and over is pre-construction testing for sealants. You know, sealants that have been uh, manufactured without much change for the last 20 years or so, and you've got a two-story uh, office building or a small branch bank or something like that, you don't need to do uh, pre-construction testing unless you have some very exotic and unusual material on the outside of your building and you want to make sure that it'll stick. But in general, that's, that's excessive and it will cost you some money. Um, 
than two if it's a, so there are both the two categories of excessive pre-construction testing of standard manufacturing products and then unnecessary field quality control testing, which we'll talk about again later. Okay. Dave's going to tell you about excessive submittals. <laughs> well, I just want to comment back. You mentioned sealants, and I think that was a great example because uh, what I have seen and I believe still exists in master spec is they have the uh, pre-construction compatibility testing included and they finish the requirement by saying that if the sealant manufacturer can provide data that shows that you've already been tested for the materials on, uh, on the job site, then the pre-construction testing is not required. So they've already left the door open, but you have the requirement in the spec and who's going to enforce that? And that comes down to the excessive submittals, because if you've asked for those pre-construction testing, now you're going to have to review the results of it, or you're going to have to review the manufacturer's product data to see if they actually tested against the substrates that you're expecting. Hey, David. Um, yes. You're kind of fading in and out. All right. I'll try to do better. I'm sorry okay. if you're not able to hear me well. Uh, the excessive submittals is something that you really do have to look at. We've, I've been following a discussion on Forspecs forum that has been discussing what kinds of submittals are really required for projects. And it seems like many of the firms are actually trying to reduce the number of submittals that they're looking at, mainly because it takes time. And if you're asking for everything, that could potentially be provided by the contractor, now you're obligated to look at it. So the kinds of things that you might see in masters would be submitting ICC uh, evaluation reports. Well, not every product out there has an evaluation report to begin with. And if you're selecting a product that you know already meets code, then why do you need to see the evaluation report telling you that, yes, it does meet code? I mean, as far as the architect is concerned, I think we have an obligation to know that the products that we're including meet code, and we really shouldn't need to be asking for those kinds of submittals. I do want to stick in a cautionary note on that one, though, David. Um, the one product that I know of that's a, that can or that can be an issue is EFs, exterior insulation and finishing systems, because the EFs is not itself specifically covered in the uh, building code. Uh, that means that to, to make it comply it has to, uh, they have to test it and get these compliance reports. Well some manufacturers, for example, test their products with 5 8 inch type X gypsum sheathing. Other manufacturers will test theirs with half inch regular gypsum sheathing. Um, I, uh, when I was doing a very large hotel a few years ago, I even found out that one manufacturer, not only did they did the testing and therefore to install their product to be code compliant, would have to have not only type 5 8 inch uh, type X exterior gypsum sheathing, but also 5 8 inch type X interior gypsum um, wall board on the exterior wall. So there are some products that we do need to, uh, to actually read those things and find out to make sure that they will work with the wall system that we've got designed. All right, I will give you that one. I would suggest <laughs> but you're right, most of the cases, we don't need it. <laughs> I would still hope the architects would be reviewing that ahead of time and yeah, design, have, designing exactly. what it is that they need for the project. Let's not make the contractors guess. That's, that's right. And we don't want to change the thickness of the uh, sh gypsum sheathing at the last minute. That's right. OK. Now it's your turn, Willis. Go ahead. Come on. OK. Excessive meetings during construction. Uh, I have seen specified pre-installation meetings for 
uh, vinyl composition tile flooring where there were there was less than 2,000 square feet of it. You know, just incidental stuff on a break room. I've seen uh, requirements for pre-installation meetings for steel s storage shelving uh, th that was in a closet in an office building. And frankly, I have more steel storage shelving in my garage at home that was required for the project. And yet, not only did the, was the architect committed to going to a pre-installation meeting, but he had to review the written minutes of the meeting. That was one of the sub excessive submittals. Um, I've seen pre-installation meetings required for break room refrigerators and microwaves where you only have one or two of these items. Now in some cases, you know, obviously if you're doing a major warehouse with steel sh storage shelving, yeah, you pr probably do want a pre-installation meeting. So there it's a, a matter of scale. Uh, similarly, if you were doing uh, a very large apartment or condominium complex, uh, you might want to talk about have a pre-installation meeting before installing uh, the appliances, uh, but you, we need to think again about what is really advancing this project at this time. Right. So I think the theme here really is the excess. You know, just to be aware of what may be excessive for the particular project. Uh, Lewis mentions the meetings. The other one that I see regularly is mock-ups. And, yes, and whether or not the mock-ups uh, would be allowed to be remain as part of the construction, and it goes to in this case quantity, where if you have only one column cover and you require a mock-up and then ask them to remove it and then install the right one, a um, little bit of excessive. Before we go on to the next thing, I think we ha we have some uh, comments. And before I get Rob to read some of those comments and questions, uh, we do want to encourage you, you can um, press the hands up button and actually uh, ask your question verbally. And we would love to hear your dulcet tones and, and uh, hear from you live and in person, so to speak. So Rob, would you catch us up on some of the comments and questions? And the first I'll read is actually regarding the uh, statement you made about um, uh, you know taking things out of the specification language. It's from Alan Iskowitz, and he, sta he states, uh, "I've always held to the premise that if, when using a master specification, something is not relative to your project, that you always take it out." Amen to that. That's exactly that's exactly the point. What you need to develop the philosophy. We encourage you to develop the philosophy that. Every paragraph in a spec master is optional, and you need to decide, is this advancing the project or not? Next comment. The next is from George Wadding. He, he writes, uh, in my experience, most specifiers are failing at edit out text that is not applicable to the project being worked upon. As an estimator for a subcontractor, I find I have no choice but to provide a brief text narrative of what I'm bidding on. In point of fact, almost every proposal I send out is labeled quote unquote conditional proposal, as well as listing inclusions and exclusions. I just hear, I, or I just heard what would be very helpful to me when you said, when in doubt, leave it out. This is exceptionally good advice. Well, there you have it, folks, from uh, our user group, so to speak, the, the end user of the specifications. And, uh, that's pretty convincing. Thank you very much for that comment. And thank you for participating in our uh, group here. And uh, and the next um, also kind of uh, reinforces that this is. I'm going to apologize here. I'm just going to say, Mr. Uh, Kirkpatrick, um, I I'm glad that you suggest get rid of these sentences. My PMs disagree with me. Well, there's uh, a. What, <laughs> yeah, I I'm stick to your guns, please. You yeah. know, uh, argue the case because. It's it's so important to get the specs written for the project and it, leaving the excessive uh, things in the spec are just going to cause confusion later. Uh, yeah, it can cost. And uh, you know, in the case that I uh, 
the uh, anecdote that I told you earlier about the excessive testing on that um, simple, otherwise rather simple uh, suburban office building project, what that the result was that I believe our firm lost a certain amount of reputation with both the contractor and the developer that we had were specifying things that were not realistic, not uh, at the same level as as other designers for this similar type of project. That can only work against you in terms of repeat business. As and then uh, the excessive requirements, as uh, David has pointed out, can cost you money during contract administration that you're going to meetings and looking at submittals that don't advance the project and all they do is cost you money. I know a lot of PMs, um, you know, our society is so litigious uh, that we do a lot of things out of fear that we shouldn't do. And we need to move beyond that and, and say, I know what good professional judgment is and I'm going to adjust the level of detail that's to the that's appropriate for this project in this place at this time for this client. And be specific. That's what specifications are all about, being specific, not generic. Right. And the thing is that what what we sometimes see is we have clients requesting that we use master spec for their office and when I start to ask them why and not that I'm trying to pick on master spec because it's still a, a, an excellent start point but they feel some level of comfort in the number of words that are included in master spec <laughs> and think, thinking that because the, this master is extensive to begin with, that there's some level of protection there. The, the fallacy in all of that is that if, if you're not saying what you really mean, and if you're not editing the spec down to exactly what is required for the project, you're, you're only hurting yourself in the end. Uh, because you're going to have to deal with the questions from the contractors, you're going to have to sort out uh, all of the requirements eventually to be able to get where you need to be. And if the contractors can't understand what you want, you're probably going to pay more for the building. Yes. And that hurts everybody in the long run. The, um, the Medcalf theory of communication is that the shorter the communication, a, the more likely it is to be understood, and B, the more likely it is to be complied with. Right. You want to be direct. Say what you want, mean what you say, and then enforce what you've said. Okay. Rob, any, any more before we go on? It's mm -hmm. an interesting comment from, from Alan uh, Iskowitz. He okay. writes, uh, if I receive a submittal from the contractor that I didn't require in the specifications, I send it back without review. Good for you. Good for you. We should all take the same approach. Yes. Right. Ask for what you need and don't review anything else. I agree. Okay. Well, the, this part is, uh, where do I start? And the answer is part two. Where else? It's a, a sound principle of editing uh, specifications or writing a, a, a fresh section from from scratch to start with part two to figure out well what products do I need to discuss uh, needs to be in here before I do anything else and one of the uh, things that can happen is that if you start with the, the uh, part one and start going through the submittals and uh, pre-installation meetings and all of that uh, administrative stuff, yeah, some of that sounds pretty persuasive and you wind up leaving it in even though when by the time when you get to part two you don't really need it. And unfortunately a lot of folks may not be aware that they need to go back and look at part one again after doing part two. So uh, do what the manual practice suggests. Start with part two and, and get started. <clears throat> and I, one of the first things to do is decide what is the primary method of specifying 
that we're going to use. Now, we all know that the proprietary method, listing a, a manufacturer and a model number, is the shortest, fastest, and the least likely for misunderstandings. And um, if you can list two or three products, that's fine. Although we all know that if you list three, the, the contractor is going to want to use manufacturer number four. And if you list four, he'll want to use number five. But it's still a, a very fast way of, of doing it. But on the other hand, if you're doing a GSA project, they may not want you to name names. And you may have to then decide, well, I've, I've got to go with a detailed uh, description of the things that I want to specify and attack it that way. So one thing is, is when you start, have a clear idea of what is needed for this project. Then the next one, if you go to the next slide, is uh, is this a product that's being specified for its performance, what it does, or for its appearance? Um, the, primary example for that, to my mind, is acoustical ceilings, is that um, when I was in Cincinnati, I had one of the sales reps for acoustical ceilings. He was a great guy and active in CSI, and every time we'd publish a spec with the other brand of acoustical ceilings, he'd come in and say, oh, but Lewis, my ceiling's got a higher uh, noise reduction coefficient. It's got more light reflectivity. It's got this. It's got that. And I'd say, yeah, but it doesn't look the same. Yeah, because uh, in some cases, my ID people are picking the product partly for performance, but they want a certain special look. And so that's going to affect whether you're going to list uh, multiple products or just going to list one only. Uh, if it's more on the performance then, uh, side, then we need to specify those things. Is the noise re uh, reduction coefficient really, really important? Then let's specify it to make sure that we get what is needed for this specific job. Over to you, David. All right. And one of the other things in part two, and now it is all in part two with the uh, performance uh, requirements for products and systems, is you need to be deciding when you do need to do uh, use delegated design because now you're having to pass uh, the design information that you need over to the contractor so that he knows what it is uh, that he has to work with to be able to meet your essential design intent. So at that sort of point, in the specification, you can really limit uh, the material descriptions or the product descriptions. Perhaps it's all uh, it's sufficient that you just identify the kinds of materials, whether it, for curtain wall, for instance, that it's an extruded aluminum, that we really don't have to talk about the description of what that aluminum is uh, other than meeting a reference standard, because now we're going to turn that design over to the contractor to actually design the curtain wall to meet a particular wind load and transfer those loads back to the building frame. Uh, you need to look at the kind of systems that are being specified and determine whether or not delegated design is really required. And virtually any of the exterior cladding materials are probably going to fall into that category because the project engineers, the structural engineers, are not going to take responsibility for designing those to meet wind loads because they're not going to have enough information from the manufacturers to be able to ensure that the uh, designs will actually meet the code requirements. The other... Now, when, David, if, yes. let's, let's get real specific. Uh, you live there in New Jersey, I'm here in Nashville, and if I'm designing a uh, three-story medical office building in uh, one of the suburbs, which uh, actually we have a project like that coming up pretty soon, um, and it's got some curtain wall in it, and it's a standard manufactured system, do I need delegated design? For curtain wall? I would say absolutely, because you still have to engineer the connections of the, the curtain wall 
back to the building frame. You have to be able to transfer those loads. If it were storefront and it was mounted within openings in your exterior wall that the structural engineer or the architect has designed that exterior wall framing, probably not. Fair. Good answer. You mean I got it right? <laughs> we think a lot alike. <laughs> oh, a scary thought. A scary thought. <laughs> a scary thought. <laughs> okay. So the proprietary items, this, this is a bit of a sticky wicket in my opinion that we've, we've mentioned specifying proprietary items now a couple of times and if, if we could enforce the proprietary specifications and be able to list a single manufacturer in the case of Lewis's acoustic ceiling panels, if we could list USG or Armstrong and pick out whichever one you want and say go buy it, you don't need any other description. Just give them the model number the, or the panel name and the edge style and you're virtually done. Uh, most bidding climates are probably not going to allow us to do that. So then it becomes a matter of a decision as to how much uh, description is really needed so that the contractor is aware of what you believe is important. Because if he's going to go out, if you're going to specify Armstrong ceiling and he wants to buy USG, but you've named an Armstrong product and nothing else, how does he know what's important to be able to substitute or to be able to offer a different kind of a product? So if you're going to allow something, the contractor to offer alternative products, you need to identify what really is important, what are those uh, salient characteristics that must be met, whether it's the noise reduction, whether it's the uh, light reflectance or anything else. That and incidentally, the, the list of uh, various performance type characteristics of a given product in a specification master, not all of those may be important to your specific project at that specific time with your specific client. So even those need to be gone through and to decide, well, what's really important? You know, if you're, if you're doing a, um, uh, a rubber roof and it's located in South Florida, the, uh, the cold weather bending over a mandrel may not be really, really important. Right. Where in the case of the acoustic ceiling, maybe it has nothing to do with acoustic performance, as Lewis had said. Maybe it has to do with the fact that it's a non-directional fine fissured or textured surface compared to any other product that's available. Yeah, or the, the reflectivity might actually be more important than the sound absorption. Could be. So know what's important, specify what really is important if you're going to allow the contractor to offer alternative products. All right, let's get caught up with some of the uh, audience uh, comments and questions, Rob. Certainly, certainly. Um, all right, um, Mr. Kirkpatrick has another question here. Um, he's asking, what do you suggest on how to enforce that required submittals be submitted? Ooh. Oh, we're not getting what we've asked for? Well, that, that's always an issue, and uh, the, the primary thing, of course, is to not review incomplete submittals, is to bounce them back, and after the first two or three, the contractor might get the message that they need to uh, look at the specs and make sure that they're sending us exactly what we want, have asked for. That we well, the other, and the other thing, too, is most of the masters that I'm or the masters I'm familiar with, the ones we're talking about today, require the contractor to, to provide a submittal register as one of his early um, submittals at, as part of Division One. So you should be checking your Division One sections to make sure that you are asking for that submittal register and do review it. 
that's getting harder and harder for us in our location uh, to get, David. Um, you know, we put that in there and we try to enforce it, but it it just doesn't. It's just not happening very often anymore. I'm not sure what the solution to that is. Are, are you getting them in your area? Well, of course, of course, as a spec I'm, consultant, I'm you get to walk away from it. You don't have to administer your specs, do you? <laughs> That's right, and I can just <laughs> explain to the architect that they need to do it. So. Uh, <laughs> I get one step removed. Whether or not they're getting it, I can't say. Uh, we, I can tell you that we've had only several of our clients ask us to generate a submittal register for them to hand off to the contractor. Uh, we've done that on occasion for several clients, and they usually ask us to do that for one or two projects, and then they usually forget about it, and we don't hear about it again even though we have uh, informed all of our clients that we can provide that service, uh, for whatever reason they don't feel the need to issue a, a list of the required submittals to the contractor. Perhaps they're getting them. Uh, I can't answer. I, I think we all agree it's, it's a great idea and it really would help everybody involved, including the contractor, but it, uh, I think at least in my area, that's getting hard to do. Uh, well, Rob, I'll make oh, one sorry. more comment on this sure. one too, Louis. Uh, for those of you that are using the website um, services for managing submittals, my understanding of those is that they set up all of the required submittals for the project. I know for a fact that Submittal Exchange does that that they actually go through the project manual and have all of those uh, required submittals entered into their system. So it's a way of managing or helping to manage the submittals that are required. And I suspect the other electronic sites are doing something similar. So if anybody is using, um, what's the other one, AESync, I think they've changed their name. Uh, but if you have experience on those sites, we'd like to hear what uh, they are doing to try to help manage that, too. Okay, Rob, uh, some more questions or comments? Yep, and a good comment from, from Tommy Smith. He said, spec what you want and want what you spec. <laughs> Unusual for ter Tommy that's very terse and to the point. <laughs> All be and, kind, Lewis. Uh, our next from Charles Cordina. Um, this kind of harkens back to what we were speaking on earlier. Uh, the presenters mentioned master spec as being quote unquote lengthy. Uh, I like the general brevity of spec link. Is there any danger in that? No, I really don't think so. As long as the essential information is there, um, one of my frustrations with master spec over the years has been um, they will never use one word if they can use a two-word phrase. Um, they prefer prior to instead of before. They will say in lieu of instead of instead of. Um, one that just used to drive me up a wall uh, that they've actually started changing is uh, for the section includes paragraph, they'll say this section includes colon rather than simply section includes. So it does seem like sometimes some of the that the guys at Master Spec get paid by the word. Okay, but but uh, one of the things I've always admired about Spectex in particular is that it is uh, very terse and to the point and omits needless words. Okay, and one thing to comment on Master Spec, realize too, Master Spec has two versions. They have a full language version and a short language version. And if you take Spec link, spec text, and master spec short language version and put them side by side and don't have any identification, you're going to have a hard time knowing which one is which. So if, if there are folks out there liking the short direct approach and you're, you're using master spec, you may very well want to look at the short language version. 
Well, I see that we're just about at the end of our hour. So rather than going ahead with part three and part one, um, I think we'll postpone those and, and continue this discussion in our next month. And as I say, um, David and I have been discussing uh, coming up with a program to talk about some of the just the nitty gritty practical things about word processing, uh, understanding styles, using macros, and some other things like that. Um, any last minute questions from the audience that that we might want to talk? I'm sorry that nobody's actually used the phone today. Well, actually, well, well I guess. Maybe going now. Oh no, I do see one hand raised. Um, if you want okay. To there. Um, Let's go there. Looks like Sarah Ahmed. I'm going to go ahead and um, mute you now, Sarah. Hello, Sarah. Sarah. No, she probably doesn't have a computer or mic. Okay. All right. You scared, All right. You scared her off. I might have done that. All right. <laughs> Let's see here. Um, the next uh, comment from Kevin O'Baron. Um, properly specified delegated design is somewhat rare. It's worth discussing how to properly delegate design to the contractor. Uh, and you're right. That that we can probably spend a whole session on that, and uh, maybe we can talk about that in a little more detail next next time. I think that's um, a great idea. Yes. Okay. We'll put that on the list. Thank you for that suggestion. You yeah. know, because ultimately, folks, you know, really. David and I want to give, uh, want to uh, lead the discussion for things that people need to hear about and uh, get some ideas about. So, if you've got some ideas for programs uh, or specific questions, uh, please uh, send them to David or me by email or to Rob Holson, our uh, CSI staff liaison, who takes care of setting these things up because uh, this is your group and we want to uh, try to provide the, the content that will interest you and bring you back next month. Yes, we welcome all comments and suggestions. So send in your cards and letters. And pictures of the grandkids. That too. Do we have anything else here, Rob, that we need to address before we log off today? Well, another another um, request for information is coming from Paul DeArmond. Um, he's asking, please discuss the exact meaning in master spec of, quote, available manufacturers and comparable products, et cetera, et cetera. OK. That sounds like it could be another topic. Yep. OK. We will put that on our list. Right, along with the delegated design. OK. Good questions. Yeah. Um, and this is another from Kevin O'Baron again. He, he states, if required submittal is not submitted, the associated work should not be paid. That usually encourages getting the required submittal. <laughs> <laughs> Hit them in the pocketbook. That works. That works. Okay. All right. Well, we're a little bit past 4 o'clock, and we want to respect your time, so we really do appreciate you joining us today. Uh, so our next meeting is, we couldn't get any closer to the first of the month. It'll be September 1st, the first Thursday in September. Uh, same time, 3 o'clock Eastern, and we hope that all of you will join us. We're going to finish uh, what we started today, and we will dive into some of the word processing uh, questions that some folks have been asking us along the way. So thank you for joining. Uh, and I'll sign off now from New Jersey. And Lewis, have we, we uh, sure enjoyed your company today and uh, this opportunity to chat with you. So thanks a lot. We we'll look forward to seeing you next month.